Let me go to a uh, coronary anomaly case. And actually, I like this one because it's, it's exactly the same anomaly that uh, we saw in a, I was just reading about in a publication from one of the Texas Medical Centers. This we'll call coronary anomaly number three. And they described a person with this very same lesion who collapsed while teaching a class, and he was in his 30s, so not during an exercise situation. And fortunately, he was resuscitated very quickly and recovered from a uh, uh, out of hospital sudden cardiac death situation and was found to have this abnormality and we can uh, use the various tools and I will quickly since they're so quick to use this will validate as the LAD here are the circumflex here we've got a circumflex vessel which is uh, I'll blow this up a little bit far more complex than the others uh, but it may I think this is just one single circumflex that then bifurcates everywhere and has four or five uh, branching vessels but I like that I'll validate that. Here's the right coronary artery. I'll validate that. The right coronary artery is the abnormal one here. And we can test uh, to see, I'm not really seeing it come up, oh, it's still drawing a center line. Let's let it finish doing the best it can to find the center line. And with good data, these are useful tools. They can actually speed your reading up quite a bit. Um, it's good that you compare and make sure that what you're validating is real. And for some reason, this is taking a little longer than usual. And if it doesn't finish and quickly, I'll go ahead and we'll skip this part, give it a few more seconds to run. Anyway, this particular patient uh, went on to be studied. OK. I'm going to go ahead, and, and I think this is somewhat apropos to the earlier question we had about making corrections. I'm going to go ahead and hold the shift button down and identify the correct vessel. And it should go ahead and successfully connect it. And, um, those of you who have read this will notify, notice that this is kind of a funny way the right coronary artery is sort of run up the AV groove here and then turn sideways. It still takes an anterior takeoff, which is typical. And I think this uh, screen down here will enable me to slice up and down. And let's just look at what the standard axial images are doing hey, here. Yes. Carter, we had a quick question from an audience member. They asked if you could comment or show an example of your reporting format and they asked if it resembled a cath report. Actually, I, I, that's a great question. I think we'll have to leave an actual example that I can put up on the screen um, uh, for the next webinar. But it, it is just like a cath report. And I think that pretty much everybody that's reporting these studies has worked in the cath lab. And it's been, a, it's been an easy transition. I know Dr. Turner uses a, a pick list where he goes ahead and selects mild, moderate, and severe, and proximal, mid, and distal, and so on, and generates a report in that way. I know Dr. Adams, who's also on this call, uh, is much more uh, prosaically uh, uh, talkative about the way he describes each vessel uniquely. But ultimately, in the summary, it comes down to both are there non-cardiac findings, and often this is provided by a radiologist who is reading in parallel. Um, or if the radiologist is doing the primary read, he would cover this. And we're talking about soft tissues and issues of the, uh, of the lung parenchyma, the chest wall, the bones, mediastinum, et cetera, that cardiologists may not be experienced with. And then the uh, cardiac findings, which are more uh, directed at the uh, great vessels, the ventricles, the valves, the pericardium, et cetera. And then the coronary findings. And most, you know, 90% of this work in, in its retail uh, iteration is looking for atherosclerosis and looking to rule it out rather than to rule it in. And so really the focus of most of these reads is on describing each coronary artery individually, uh, giving some descriptive visual of how big it is and what the branches are, that the origins are normal, and then uh, describing plaque as either uh, calcified, uncalcified, or mixed, and uh, whether uh, it is uh, normal, uh, minimal, mild, moderate, or severe. And those are really the descriptors that, that we typically use in a report. So um, for the next webinar, it's a, it's a good point. And we'll bring up some uh, report samples that I think will illustrate this. And what I've got into view here, you can just find out in a uh, just a simple, thin slice through the, uh, you know, we're looking obliquely at a vessel. It's not straight up and down. And so this isn't necessarily the perfect view. And the left main, I think, might be a little bit distorted. But what I'd like you to see is this little narrow offshoot of a vessel. It sort of takes off and runs backward at about 70, 179 degrees where it's supposed to go. Here's the AV groove on the right. And typically, you know, the right coronary artery is coming out headed right for the sternum here. And we often don't see it on the straight coronal views. But here it's coming off almost from the uh, 
a common origin with the uh, left main coronary artery. Certainly it's arising from the left sinus of Valsalva, which is here. And if we go back to the curved planar reformations, and I think I can bring us back here, um, the, the uh, software tools were pretty successful in, in sort of recognizing that. Let's see how they render the orifice. Um, and I'm just going to twist around and take these masks off. And this, uh, we really don't see any atherosclerosis. We see an area of motion artifact, which you'll come to recognize very quickly. Um, but boy, that right coronary artery, there's a good deal of it. Looks about the same. We've got the whole vessel. So it's a dominant vessel. Here it comes, and this is actually traveling on the inferior margin here. But you see this very oblique takeoff, very high likelihood that part of this vessel is traveling within the aortic wall itself. Uh, and this is just the exact lesion that was described. And I think it's a worrisome lesion to find. Uh, how do you know whether these are malignant or not? I think in older patients, we'd feel more comfortable if these are probably uh, people that by virtue of the fact they're still around, that have survived whatever complications would have presented themselves at a younger age when maybe people were playing vigorous tennis or jogging marathons or things. But, um, but these are unpredictable things. And here this, this vessel is traveling between the, the aorta, which is clearly here, and the pulmonary outflow tract, which is here. And whether it moves high or low, I just think you've got to be very worried about the fact that, that here in diastole, when things are kind of relaxed, although it doesn't appear to be squeezed, I think there's a very high likelihood that this could easily uh, be a lesion which is uh, periodically ischemic. Uh, the, these people typically do not have positive stress tests and they don't have symptoms necessarily during exercise. And so how do you treat it? I think, um, I think we, we, uh, we see this lesion quite often and maybe a little more frequently than it's reported at about 1% and, and maybe that the uh, right way to treat this in a young person. And I don't really recall if this was or wasn't a young person, but I think this is a serious coronary anomaly. And we stumble onto them all the time. And I think their uh, CT is just wonderful to identify them. OK, enough said about this. And we can take questions. I'd like to show uh, a case that was sent in from the audience if we don't. Uh, but we can pause, and I'll sort of prepare that. Or maybe I'll sort of pause here in case there are questions about that anomaly. Rob, why don't you moderate this? OK, sure. Um, Dr. Adams, is your microphone working? I hope so. Is it working? Can you hear me? Yeah, there you are. Now, that was a terrific case. Uh, I uh, would also mention, Carter, that you can look at the cross sections on the bottom of your screen there to look at you know, high-grade lesions, you know, to look in the cross section very quickly when you look at those. But th those are great cases. Thanks, Jim. I'll put it up. I see we're doing pretty good on time. Um, this is the case that I originally wanted to uh, bring up to everybody's attention. So before we go to Dr. Turner's case, uh, let me put this up on the screen and point out exactly what you're uh, describing. And we'll, again, I don't want you to think that we're only going to show beautiful cases. I always get tired of reading reports and stuff, and you realize that only your a lot of the big centers only put their best stuff up, and this is these are beautiful scans. And in the course, we we do put up bad scans because that's that's part of the reality of these things. But let me go ahead and just let the left anterior descending case uh, be selected on this one, and I'll run this uh, quickly to point out what you've just said, Jim. Here we've got the right coronary artery being drawn, and what I didn't mention, and I think this is probably a good one to show it on. Now, this is the case that I originally intended. We have these two little cross-sectional arrows. And down below, reference in either red or blue, we can use for comparison. So we have the blue area, which typically we want to position in a, in a normal segment. Of course, this is the problem with angiography. It's hard to tell without knowing the, what the components of the wall really are. It's hard to tell what really is or isn't normal. And this has been a problem for ages. But let's compare this area uh, right here, which I think is probably a, a section of nearly normal vessel, as best we can tell. And I'm going to go ahead and drag, uh, drag this information up. And let's put this little cross section here across uh, across an area where I think we've got trouble. Let me just position it a little higher. And let me just point out down below that this little red area in cross section, I think I can blow this up a little bit. And I hope all the viewers can see this. Uh, obviously, these are fuzzy images. And so let's not 
think that these are actually drawn to these extremely high degrees of accuracy that two decimal places uh, represent. But we've got an area dimension here of t roughly two and a half millimeters. We've got an area dimension here of roughly three and a half ma uh, millimeters. So this would be, uh, obviously this wouldn't be a critical stenosis, and I don't think any of us would have judged that. Uh, but we do have the facility of these tools to draw two things, a maximum and a minimum diameter across the cross-section, and also give us an area calculation. We can look at that and see if we agree that that's a fair compromise of what the true boundary might be. So this would be a stenosis which would be categorized as it's soft tissue, is that there's no calcium there, and probably categorized as mild, and that is, again, very unlikely that this would represent a, uh, a significant uh, flow-limiting lesion. Uh, there are other findings on this case, but I think in the interest of time, I've hopefully made that point. Um, and I'll go ahead and go back to uh, the case that Dr. Turner kindly prevented, uh, provided. And I'll put this in as a, a difficult one, but I think we stumble onto a lot of stuff in CT, and I don't know if Dr. Turner stumbled onto this or, or whether he'll, he'll uh, we'll maybe let him speak about it. And real quick, uh, I got a comment from Dr. Turner. He said that a mitocardial perfusion scan might well show ischemia and that he has sent a similar case for re-implant of coronary. Oh, of that uh, right coronary artery, a coronary anomaly that we showed, I, I, I kind of agree. That looks so terrible at its origin that uh, I, w I really wouldn't be surprised at all if that were a positive test. And if it were, that would be just the nudge that you needed to send a patient like that probably to some sort of a surgical revision. I know there are people that have put stents in those vessels, but I think a vessel like that would be very, very difficult to get into. And in fact, the case that I read about that was just presented in the uh, Methodist Hospital Journal said they couldn't couldn't engage it even to put a, a flow wire down it to try to do, get some sort of or an ultrasonic wire to try to get some assessment of the origin. So sure, and I, would, I agree with him. I would expect that that uh, that lesion like that would give us a positive stress test. Um, okay, let's go ahead and bring this up. I don't know the full story, although we've had some email dialogue about this case, but the question is um, about the ventricle. And so I'm going to go ahead and, and lay this out and say um, the study is uh, good. There's some motion artifact here, and we see a little bit of blurring in 3D. Um, we're not going to spend time necessarily on the coronaries because I believe that, that Dr. Turner mentioned that they turn, turned out to be normal. But what I would like to do and, uh, is look at the uh, just the two-dimensional planar reformations here, and I'll go ahead and use some of these tools to get this sorted out as a we'll look first at the axial sections. And then um, we notice a couple of things. One, it's a good study. All the contrast is on the left instead of the right. Here's a nice, this is probably the only place where anything is going straight up and down, if not the descending aorta, the, the sort of mid portion of the right coronary artery. No motion. It's a nice study. And let me just see if we can uh, open this up a little bit with some of our tools and and what I'll do is try to just drag this out a little bit and create sort of a, a four-chamber view. I'll move slowly this little momentum as we get this out. And here's a nice view. And let me just roll this down. And uh, Dr. Turner noted that he thought the trabeculations were exaggerated and that the little crypts that we can see here. And let me I might be able to improve on the way this looks a little bit by changing the brightness and contrast a bit. And I don't want to exaggerate it too much, uh, but that might be a little bit better. And he was unhappy about how uh, on the, what well, I guess this would be sort of the lateral and uh, infralateral surface of the ventricle. Certainly, we don't see trabeculations typically, and we know this from any of the modalities that this is normally a smooth area. As we come around the apex, there are areas over here where these crypts are quite deep. And I'll draw a couple of... Uh, I'll take this one over here, and I'll sort of use some of the echo criteria and draw this as the distance between a crypt. I might have gone too far, so let me get rid of that one. Try that one more time. Let me take, uh, say, this point here and draw it to the epicardial surface here. That's probably a good rendering. And then let's look at the thickness of the myocardium itself and pick an area, say, uh, right here draw that over to the surface. 
And the point is that we're real close to this two-to-one relationship. And I think these were derived from echo studies. And um, so is this a non-compaction, uh, either of the left ventricle or a portion of the left ventricle? I think a patient probably does meet the echo criteria for this. Um, and, I, and of course, we all know that these modalities and measurements don't necessarily transfer one to the other. There's a lot of variability. But we do have the ability to really accurately look at these crypts and, uh, and see how deep they are, look at the trabeculations. They are certainly exaggerated in this patient. And uh, so with that comment, could this be uh, non-compaction cardiomyopathy? I, I think the answer is yes, it could be. Um, th this is a relatively new disease, and I don't think anybody knows um, outside of the academic environment necessarily knows a lot about it. But um, uh, Another thing, we just got asked if you could show the short access view. Sure, absolutely. Um, let's, uh, let's set up a short access view like this and go to a straight coronal view and then rotate into it. Typically, a short axis view, I consider a 45 degree um, LAO with uh, some caudal cranial angulation of about 15 degrees. I think I might have overdone the, uh, the brightness and contrast here, so let me see if I can make things look a little bit better, some tweaking. Mm, that could be good. Let me go to the CTA window here. Um, I think that looks pretty good to me, and I hope it's transmitting uh, well. What I would, uh, I might be able to get that short axis a little better tuned up uh, if we go a little steeper. This might be a slightly better short axis view. We, and. You know, we don't want to mistake papillary muscles, and this is one here, and this is sort of a two-headed papillary muscle here on the inferior surface, I think. But I believe what Dr. Turner was concerned about were some of these areas over here and these big crypts. And people with this condition, as and I'm fairly fresh on this since I was on Wikipedia yesterday about it, are, are quite uh, uh, systemic emboli prone. And if a lot of the ventricle is involved, it doesn't squeeze well, and they can be prone to symptoms of... Uh, of systolic heart failure. And uh, I sent Dr. Turner a message last night asking if there was a, either hereditary uh, 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 indicators in the patient's history or if the patient uh, had performance issues with walking and symptoms that might be heart failure related, or if they'd had uh, systemic emboli, uh, either to the brain or elsewhere, of course. And, and the answer to that was no. And so he doesn't really meet clinical criteria. And all I would just say that if you see something like this, this is this is more trabeculation. These trabeculations are exaggerated. And probably like a lot of modalities, the more we look, the more we hear researchers uh, report, uh, the more these questions come up. It's a good question. Um, and as we change our depth in here, we'll, we'll move into the papillary muscles and we approach the, the mitral valve itself. And, um, and once again, we don't have hypertrophy. We do have symmetry of the opposing walls. So a lot of the criteria for a normality of the myocardium is met until we look at these big, deep hypertrophic crypts that we see over here. So I think the answer to this question, if this is non-compaction, is a is a definite maybe. And uh, good. So why don't we uh, why don't we stop there? I'm sorry, Dr. Turner couldn't verbally uh, join us, but I think I covered his uh, thoughts on that. And um, we, I only I only comment I have to make is that it's terrific fun to get cases sent in. So if any of you plan to attend our next webinar next month. Um, uh, get a hold of us via email, or Rob, you may have a mechanism for this so that we can get the, the studies sent. Uh, you can anonymize them, or we can anonymize them. We'll put them up on the cloud. This is all uh, can be done very securely, and uh, your uh, patients won't have their information up on YouTube or anything like that. So we, we, we can handle this well, and we'd be happy to discuss cases uh, live. And this kind of illustrates how we can, we can mentor you, and we can answer questions about your particular issues, and we'd like to do that. Okay, Rob, yes, anyone, I pass the mic back to you. Yeah, and anyone anyone that has a particular subject matter they'd like us to cover on these conference on these uh, webinars, or if you want us to review one of your uh, one of your cases, please email us at info at virtual hyphen cme dot com. And uh, Dr. Turner has commented. He said LVEF normal palpitations, but no no syncope or SUD in family in family. 
uh, okay, no syncope and no cardiac death in the family, or sudden cardiac death in the family is what I think he means, right. Okay, well good, that's helpful. So that might sway me against the idea that this is non-compaction. And uh, I think the more you see, the more and the more you learn that kind of information, and maybe everybody that uh, tucks this way in their mind, uh, they've seen this before, and uh, it may be an extreme, about two standard deviations out of what uh, turns out to be normal. Good, okay, that's very helpful. Okay, great. I think that that answers all of our questions. We've got, uh, does anyone have questions about the software or any of the courses? Um, please feel free to put your hand up or type in a question. And Marianne, are you still with us? Yes, I am. So, and we have Marianne with uh, Terra Recon on board with us as well, so. Okay, we have a quick question from Dr. Lee. Uh, he asked, if in our case reviews, do we ever use catheterization to compare to CT? Uh, we do, I, and this is one of the frustrating parts is sometimes the good cases we don't get good, um, and you'll all of you know this, you find an interesting echo and you want to know what ended up with this patient and it's, they've gone elsewhere and so on and so forth. You don't really get the kind of follow-up you need. We do on, I would say, about 80% of the cases in our uh, uh, library here, we do have calf correlations and we show those in the video reviews and then about 30 percent we don't, not because we didn't wish we did, but just because we couldn't get a hold of them. But the CTA cases were still sufficiently valuable that we uh, go ahead and present them anyway. It's terribly helpful to have, um, you know, IVIS or PET or actual direct angiography co for comparison because those are the tools that we, that are more familiar to all of us. But we just don't, we don't get them as often as we'd like, and that's, that's unfortunately true. But on most of these, we do have cath comparisons. Okay, and I um, believe that uh, that was our last question. Marianne, is there anything you'd like to add to any of this? Um, well, the capabilities, um, Dr. Newton was actually doing a lot of validation over there from the upper right-hand corner, which we call a workflow template. These workflow templates can be customized to your specific use if you did have them at your institution. The reason Dr. Carter Newton was actually validating those was the fact that these can actually be saved as a works in progress scene so that when you open the case back up, you open the scene and you're able to actually um, edit what has been done without losing any of the work that you've done. Great. Listen, this is uh well, we've got it back up here. I, this was a case I was so looking forward to showing everybody because it makes such a good point. If we still have attendees that um, are with us, this was this patient that I gave the history for that had been twice to the emergency room. And um, actually, that other case could have illustrated the same clinical story. But what I really wanted everybody to see was how uh, ugly people that appear to be completely healthy can actually uh, have their coronaries look, and this is the left, this is this patient who was twice to the ER, hadn't had a stress test, didn't have much in the way of risk factors, um, and we don't know the intimate details of what else she might have had going on, but this is a non-diabetic, non-smoking woman, but look at this plaque in the distal left main proximal LAD here, and, and also notice that there's almost a suggestion that there might be a little bit of dissection into the plaque from the LAD side. And it's hard to know, but this looks so complex. This could be calcium, which is sort of forming in the wall. But I think not only is there a suggestion of a stenosis at this vessel at the origin of the left main, but there's all this uh, sort of multi-characteristic plaque, calcified linear, calcified nodule here, and then really more uncalcified than not, and also the suggestion that there may be some rupture into the plaque itself. So. Could this be the sort of thing that brought a patient to the emergency room? Whatever was there and nearly occluding this vessel resolved if it was soft and of a, more of a thrombotic nature locally. And then uh, the patient goes home with normal enzymes and an EKG with that doesn't express an infarction or actually ischemia, which may have been, you know, may have been gone by the time they get seen. Then you look at a lesion like this and you, you really have to say, gee, I think we had someone that was gave us a warning sign that she was very lucky about, and we somewhat fortuitously have stumbled on it with this technique. Maybe people wouldn't have capped her, and it's possible that someone like this could pass a stress test, but I think a patient like this 
need to be sort of rushed to the cath lab and have what was uh, undoubtedly an acute unrecognized coronary syndrome dealt with with an intervention. That's just my opinion. Anyway, okay, Rob, I don't want to just burn up whatever time is left. If there are other questions or if you have some uh, technical issues you want to uh, lay out there for our attendees, go ahead. I've sort of said everything sure. I was hoping to get to say. We actually have a question if you could show the cross-sectional view and the level of the lesion and possible rupture. In this one here? You bet. Let's take, um, I'm going to take this part, the blue part, and say I'm going to use this to, to render the normal segment of vessel. It may not be normal. And by dragging it up there, we see we've got an average diameter of two millimeters. That's smaller than a normal adult's left main in terms of a diameter. And I'll bring this up to the, to the area where I think some of the dissection may be. I'll position it first in the mid portion of where I think the severity of the stenosis is greatest. And look down at the cross sections here. Let me magnify these up. And um, in comparison, let's see if I can find an area of normal vessel which uh, looks a little bit bigger. I'm not sure that I can. Here we've got an average diameter of uh, 2.8 millimeters, a diameter over here of 2.10 millimeters. And I'm not sure that things are kind of working out exactly the way I would have expected them because this is rendering a stenosis, which is quite a little, quite a bit less. Let me sort of sweep this along and see if we don't jump into something that looks a little more severe. Um, and let me take this mask on and off. If visually I were to compare what I'm circling over here on the left with a cross section through this part of the uh, of the coronary artery to a segment right here, let me turn our information back on. I would have expected the recognition of that lesion to be quite a bit worse, and I think. Um, I think there's an inaccuracy here where I would just say, um, you know, visually this looks like a, a more severe lesion, and I think that's probably fair. It's not realistic to uh, accept actual uh, diameter or area measurements um, on this. There's probably a way I could convert this to an area instead of a diameter measurement. But if we, if we take, I think we do have a very accurate representation of the apparent volumes. Look at all this soft tissue which is out here. This really is the only place where there's little contrast. And then we have this huge positive remodel section over here with a terrific plaque bulk and quite a bit of heterogeneity in the plaque as well. So just in visually comparing this segment with this segment, I'd say there's clearly a reduction of greater than 50%. So this is at its best, I think, would be accurately characterized as a moderately severe lesion. Um, and then we haven't really talked about the properties in cross section, so I think that was a a question. Let me bring, let me move this little cross section down a little bit into that area where we might have had some hemorrhage, and I'll position it right there, and let's see what that looks like if I take the mask off. And I, I think it's a little harder to represent. Uh, I've over magnified it. Uh, I think it's a little hard to over represent what we're looking at. But um, Hounslow unit wise, here we're at. Seven, eight hundred. So we probably have calcium in here as well as contrast. Here, our, our Hounsfield units are six hundred, seven hundred. The actual density of this uh, of the contrast enhanced blood was greater than usual, and um, we dimmed it down a little bit. But I, th I think we probably have uh, both calcification here and some contrast, which is dissecting back up into the vessel. It's it's a little bit hard to make make proof of that by just looking at the cross sectional images. Okay, I better stop there. My sentences are getting long. Yeah, and actually, uh, we are pretty much uh, at the at the end of our webinar right now. So I want to uh, thank everyone for attending, and thank uh, Dr. Carter Newton and uh, Marianne from Terra Recon for attending.